Welcome to episode 6 of the 7th season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode we're going to interview Michael Meeks and Bjorn Michelson about LibreOffice and we're going to read out your feedback and have a command line love and, well that's about it really. Um, If you're listening live you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and you can also join the hash UUPC IRC channel which is on the Freenode network. I'm Tony and joining me this week are... Well, three smiley, happy faces, completely different in attitude from the ones that you heard last week on the show. Um, joining us first is Alan. Ah, oh, hello, Tony. How are you? I'm really good, mate. How are you? I'm fine. Excellent. It's spiffing and super to see you. Oh, dear. Um, Mark is also here. All right. <laughs> good. And, <laughs> and Laura. Hiya. Yeah, catchphrase-tastic. So, Mark, what have you been up to? Uh, I have been playing around with uh, Acme Wake-Ups on my home theatre PC. Good, thanks for coming along. Ma- <laughs> Alan, no, Mark, what, what does that mean? Acp or ACPI? ACPI, that's the sort of power management, low-level BIOS stuff on uh, most PC but what boards. does it mean? So, basically, what I, what I, I've, my, my HTPC in my living What's room... What's an HTPC? Shut up. <laughs> uh, what is it? Home theatre PC oh. has has a, a PVR dongle. What? PVR. It. <laughs> Shut up, all of you. What's a dongle? Um, <laughs> so I want it to wake up when it needs to record something, record it, and then turn off again without me having to do anything to save energy. To save energy. Um, oh, good. good. And does it work? Uh, and it does work. So yeah, basically, you the BIOS clock has like an alarm feature which you could activate by doing a bit of messing around in Ubuntu. So I've got a script which runs. Um, when something has finished recording, which uh, which makes sure no nothing else is going on, and then shuts it down by calling XBMC shutdown command, which can then send the time of the next recording to another script, which then sets the wake up command. So then it turns off completely, and then the wake up alarm goes off five minutes before the next recording, and it wakes up, and the whole thing starts again. Huh. Does it does it ever wake up and press snooze and go back to sleep again? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right, Alan? As- I don't think that's a perfectly valid question. What if the program that, that Mark was going to record has changed time? Your 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 script won't be able to cope with it. If the if the program's moved, yeah. you'll wake up, start recording, and you'll clip off the end. Um oh well. I'll There we go. Uh, oh, oh, actually, uh, one, of, one of the one of the really cool thing I found is um there's there's a GUI for doing this called Wake On Plan. Ooh, oh, which I lets see what you they did there. Yeah, yeah, which lets you set a plan. Like, it basically gives you a calendar and you say, you set the time to wake up and click a button and hmm. it sets the alarm for you so you don't have to faff with the command line. Interesting. Excellent. Excellent. Alan, Excellent. what have you been up to? I have been uh, dealing with a ButterFS catastrophe that oh, actually oh. turned out not to be a catastrophe at all. Oh. It was just a dodgy cable. <laughs> 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 or a cable that was. So, uh, it wasn't plugged in probably. I've got uh, this server, and I probably need to find a better location for it. It's an HP micro server. <laughs> Is it with balanced on the edge of your worktop? Close. <laughs> it's on top of the fridge. And, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I know the one. Yeah. yeah, the fridge freezer, yeah. So the server, and then the, the eight-disc array is sat on top of the server. Is this in the alcove? Uh, in the utility room. Yeah. Yeah. Where the dodgy electric Where the dodgy electric Yeah, yeah, there. Uh, and uh, so it's all balanced on there. And there's two SATA cables that come out the back of the micro server and go into the, the array. And it's, you know, kind of worked. But every so often something messes up and I keep getting these ATA errors in my in my kernel log on the oh. server. And I'm like, oh, no, it's a disaster. And I debugged it all with um, Hugo and um our good friend hugo and he just, just pl- run him. Him in. <laughs> yeah well he's in the butterfs support channel so i'm trying to figure out if it was a butterfs problem or a disk problem or a cable problem or the array or whatever and so we nailed it down to it being one of the cables or both of them that they're not uh, they're esata ones but they don't have the locking mechanism on they're little oh, plastic yeah. ends okay and you push them in so being sat on top of the fridge i'm sure the percussive uh, <laughs> slamming of the fridge freezer by the kids right. getting get lollies and, and stuff out. out yeah exactly uh, has knocked it loose and that but it, once I put it all back together again and I just mounted it in recovery mode it was fine no data loss whatsoever is that why they don't s- store servers on top of fridges in data centers I don't know I, I, I'm not sure it's good because it's up out of the way of 10 year old kids so if you've got any 10 right. year old kids running around in a data center put, <laughs> put the servers on top of the fridge because they can't reach them yeah and you know it keeps the butter cool yeah Laura <laughs> <laughs> Laura, you've been doing anything interesting? Uh, no, just moving piles of paper around the living room floor. Right, right, great. That you, I can see there are piles of paper. Yeah. So. And if the pile's too big, it gets made into smaller piles. I think by piles. living room, I think you mean Studio L. Yeah. 
<clears throat> what about yes, you, Tony? Yeah. What have you been doing? Oh, mostly eating chocolate because it was Easter and uh, I was eating chocolate. I had some time off work. I thought, what am I going to do with it? Eat okay. chocolate. But, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Should we get on with the show? Yes. Yes. <laughs> We're talking to Michael Meeks and Bjorn Michelson. Hi, guys. Hey, good to see you. So, Michael Hello. Uh, Michael works for Collabora and the Document Foundation, and Bjorn works for Canonical and the Document Foundation. So, to start with, guys, what is the Document Foundation and why do we need it? Great question. Bjorn, I think, you know, you're the expert in Document Foundations. <laughs> <you know. laughs> <laughs> okay, what's the Document Foundation? And why do we need it? Well, the Document Foundation is uh, the thing that uh, brings together all the companies that work on uh, LibreOffice and, more importantly, all the volunteers that work on LibreOffice so that we uh, can bring LibreOffice to the public. You say companies that work on, on LibreOffice, you know, it, it, is, it, is it not just a traditional open source project with a bunch of individuals, you know, in their back room somewhere uh, doing a bit of coding? What, what, what commercial kind of interest is there in LibreOffice? I think that's a great question. So, uh, clearly, Collabora is passionately involved here, uh, but I think there are other companies, you know, we've seen Lenido, uh, Red Hat, SUSE, of course, uh, Canonical uh, are putting uh, work in there. We've seen companies like AMD investing in it, we've seen other companies interested, like FutureMark, shipping it in the latest version of you know PCMark 8.2. Um, lots of you know governments and consultancies contributing uh, back to the code in various ways. Um, so you know finding some way to get all of these guys under one roof and you know coordinating and encouraging them to work together, um, which so far seems quite easy actually. Uh, there's a number of things we've done there to make that uh, fly, but uh, yeah, it's going pretty well. When you say they they're contributing, I mean they're there's various ways in which they can contribute. Is it is it workforce in all of them, or are there people giving financial contributions so you can run conferences? I know you recently had uh, one in Gran Canaria, I believe. Is, it, is that the kind of contribution you're talking about, or is it wider than that? So uh, in, in Gran Canaria, actually, I'm still on Gran Canaria and Las Palmas. Uh, we had a hackfest, so uh, it's not directly involved with the company, but we worked here together with the university to... Uh, actually to show how to get involved in open source development. So, uh, and also to get uh, the, uh, the old-time contributors uh, of LibreOffice together and, uh, well, to have some face time and uh, get push things forward, discuss some, some things face-to-face uh, uh, -face is some, something that helps a lot. Definitely. And there are huge numbers of volunteers. Let's give you a couple of weird uh, examples. So, for example, the Chaos Computer Club, mm -hmm hosted us, which is fantastic for a hack fest. Um, but I don't know if we got any code contributions, whereas Munich city government also hosted us and made code contributions. So, you know, they, they have their own code in LibreOffice and they use it. So what does that say for government? I mean, I don't know. Impressive, eh? Yeah. Uh, but of course, we have huge numbers of volunteers uh, as well from all, all manner of places with and without affiliations. Um, but yeah, there's quite a large corpus now of people working full time on, on LibreOffice, which is which is extremely encouraging. Or oh, another company I forgot to mention is Cloudon, who are doing all sorts of exciting things in mobile uh, around LibreOffice and, and contributing there. And Cinezip, who are a consulting company, uh, Egalia are putting uh, code in <laughs> daily. So you know, th there's a lot of people around it, and it, it's just growing and exciting. You know, nice nice to see that finally. So you mentioned mobile. What sort of things would you do on mobile? That's Great question. So we already cross-compile to uh, ARM, and mm -hmm. we run really nicely there. In fact, can, uh, Canonical and Ubuntu were involved in some of the early ARM porting work there to make it work on you know small mobile devices, actually years ago. Um, but the, the cross-compiling work is, is, is pretty nice. So we can compile to iOS, and we can compile to Android. There are prototypes on both those platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know we, uh, we have not got anything too crazy to announce right now, but uh, you know watch this space. So... LibreOffice is sort of now the sort of de facto standard office suite on the on the Linux desktop. So is um, is mobile now the the next target market for LibreOffice, or are there other things in the in the pipeline? So I think diversity is a huge strength, and uh, I think at least uh, you ask me, and I have a view. Bjorn, 
has another view. You know, Canonical has one. And, and so the great thing is that there's no opportunity cost. We can pursue all of these ends all at once. So, uh, yeah, sure, some companies are taking it to mobile. Uh, my company, of course, is looking very hard at supporting people on PCs, on Windows. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, but it all runs beautifully <laughs> on Linux as well. Uh, you know, and okay, hey, we can support your Macs uh, as well. Um, oh, so, uh, you know. That. Ah, there you go. You know, if you're an, uh, an evil Mac user, you well, can, uh, you know. Well, you know, my um, I, my wife uses a Mac at home, and <laughs> my wife, she, I might see. Yeah, yeah, and my kids. Uh, not me. No, I don't use the filter. Not you. Uh, but I, it's, it's but she, you know? she transfers documents, and I think the the um, the document handling has has improved dramatically. It's always been that 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 uh, stick you can easily beat OpenOffice and then LibreOffice with is, oh, well, I, you know, I, I can't open my documents. Or when I open them, the formatting's all screwy. And more recently, I just don't seem to be hearing that. I don't know if everyone I know is writing really simple documents or whether it's just it, it's it's so much better. I'm, I'm, like, I'm hoping it's the latter. Has a lot of work gone into the, the document uh, uh, technology that, that opens and saves other formats? I think it's safe to say there's constant work on that. Um, one of the new things that we're doing that's quite interesting, and, and uh, Cloudon have actually funded this, is that if we don't understand something in the OpenXML file format, which is this huge and gnarly and tangly thing, um, then at least we try and store that internally, and then we put it back again where it was when we're repacking the document into the you know, truck to send it off. And so although maybe we didn't quite fully unpack that, we it back and so hopefully you get a much better round trip fidelity for your documents uh, which is which is a nice new feature in 4.2 uh, 4.3 will improve that uh, yet further but yeah sure we do a whole lot of work but hey the best way to get perfect fidelity interoperability is to simply use LibreOffice everywhere so you know on your PC on your Mac on your Linux machine and use ODF and then you don't have a problem and increasingly you know on mobile so so you know why use anything else we we interoperate really well with ourselves you know that's <laughs> That's something yeah, Microsoft I, can also do. I think, I think the problem is other people. <laughs> that's, that's the big problem. Is I operate, I interoperate quite well with myself. Yeah, no, it's, it's all these others. That, yeah, that's a problem. Well, then the good thing is you can tell the other people get LibreOffice. You know, it's it's free. It's beautiful. It, uh, you know. In terms of the interface, it's very similar to sort of older versions of Microsoft Word. Um, with the toolbar and everything. And I'm not saying you should follow the ribbon approach, but it's that kind of, are you planning to do more novel things with the user interface design? So we, uh, we do an incremental uh, approach to, to uh, improve the interface because we are not suddenly going to uh, dump a completely new interface that scares everyone off and every business user runs away screaming hmm. uh, on LibreOffice. But uh, we clearly see that there are areas where we can improve the interface uh, quite a lot. Um, as for the stuff that other pro uh, products use, well, we don't take that uh, as, uh, as, um, as something to mimic because, well, you probably can do better than uh, other projects do. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, overall, though, Laura, you're right. I think the UI has been a bit constrained in the past, and we're doing a chunk of work. Actually, Red Hat are doing work. Uh, Quaylon McNamara has been spearheading a huge rework of all of our dialogues uh, to make them resizable, to make it possible for UI designers to come in and relay them out and tweak them okay. and make them better. So there's, there's quite a lot there. Unfortunately, you don't necessarily see that. I mean, it's more accessible. It looks better with different size widgets. It's... It's going to be beaut more beautiful, um, but that happens dialogue by dialogue. And with, you know, uh, hundreds of dialogues, this takes, uh, you know, actually a significant time. So it's been three releases we've been pushing this out. And maybe we'll be finished for 4.4. Uh, Let's see. So uh, branching out to a, a related question, one, one of the words that seems to be uh, used a lot at the moment, especially with um, Office products, is the cloud. And... Uh, <laughs> You've already said that you know you can port uh, LibreOffice across to different platforms, especially low-power mobile devices like phones and tablets. And you know, lean laptops seem to be quite popular. The Chromebook being a, a very uh, hot-selling item on uh, on Amazon in the last year or so. Is there, is there a place for um, chunky desktop uh, apps when? 
a lot of the market seems to be moving towards the web app side of things. I think the API surface that the web exposes is perhaps not quite what it could be. So, uh, for example, you know, if you uh, are using LibreOffice on Linux, uh, you know, you get great integration with your Bluetooth, for example. Your, your phone, you know, can be used as a remote control and you can see your slides and your next slide and you can drive your presentation using that. That's, a, that's quite a nice feature. Um, we have, you know, the greatest multimedia integration with your native platform stuff. We, we try and merge into your desktop with theming uh, that matches your toolkit so that you look, you know, not like a sort of squatting alien, but like something that fits in nicely. Um, right. Now, unfortunately, when you, when you start to jump into the browser, um, the API surface that the browser provides is, let's face it, pretty, pretty pathetic. Uh, you know, the web people think they're cool because they just added the ability to make sounds happen. Right. Uh, you know, like, like the ability to make sounds was there on my BBC Micro, uh, you know, I, I don't know, back in the day, you know, Model B. And, and, uh, and this is hardly revolutionary. Um, but they still haven't, for example, uh, allowed us to uh, find out the printer or what printers are connected, what page sizes there are. Do they have other trays? You can, you know, so if you want to print anything out, you don't want to use the web as you will discover if you try and print anything out on the web, uh, you know, like a, a Google map or something. Um, and that's before you get uh, trying to make your nice remote control work, you know, beautifully. And before you go to a customer's site to do your flashy presentation and there isn't an internet connection there. And so you can't get to your slides. So in general, I, I'm a bit of a fan of the thick client. You know, I prefer to take my data with me on my you know, Ubuntu phone thing, um, or you know, Nexus One, or whatever it is. I and, believe and that's just, the official branding. <laughs> yeah, it's thing. It's, I'm sure it's going to be awesome, and um, and and actually project it from that, uh, so that I'm confident that it really is going to work. And I've tested it beforehand, and it's you know, it's going to be slick. It sounds like you've had this conversation with a number of people <laughs> recently. <laughs> yes, uh, honest. And, and that, that that makes me think that you're you're coming up against resistance as if uh, there are people out there who are seeing you know google docs or other cloud based things as as competition so maybe you know microsoft office isn't the competition anymore maybe it is you know google docs is that what you're finding crikey what a good question i mean I don't know that we compete with Google Docs. I think it's a co-belligerent in a war for choice, you know? Uh, and, and I think, you know, that, that's great. You know, we want to free people up so that they can choose the office suite that fits their needs, uh, you know, the best. And, and we want to winsomely persuade them to choose a free software one. I think that's, that's at least where my heart is. And TDF, you know, is clearly a, a big driver of uh, open source, free software, um, you know, um, ethos. Hence the name Libra, Libra Office, you know, for yourself. But uh, yeah, sure. I mean, we get we get comments about the web. Um, I think uh, Louis Via back in, uh, you know, five years ago told me, you know, Libra Office will be dead, uh, you know, in, in only a month's time or something. So you better immediately rewrite it all for the web. Right. And the funny thing is, it hasn't happened yet. And, you know, the world changes in fun ways. So I, I'm pretty optimistic about fat fat clients and uh, web browsers are fat clients too so <laughs> True. let's see um i've got uh, a question which is probably for bjorn if he's still uh, if he's still there yes i'm back okay brilliant um so we've just uh we've just had an lts release of ubuntu so what can we expect to see for LibreOffice on ubuntu on in the next lts cycle uh, is there a, a port to mia on the cards ha <laughs> excellent answer next question uh, i'll i'll do that next weekend yeah so uh <laughs> so uh there is some kind of a, a road to that which is uh the gtk3 uh backend for LibreOffice, right which uh michael did a lot of work on so um uh it only has to be uh completed <laughs> And uh, then, then we can uh, then we can um, do that on Mir um, too. Of course, well, that's uh, doing uh, a backend in in, uh, in the very low level of LibreOffice. So uh, it probably involves quite a bit of testing uh, and uh, getting stuff done. On the other hand, the LTS release is still a bit off. But um, yeah, I think we need at some point to think about getting there. I think on that topic, we, we're pretty eclectic inside, uh, you know, LibreOffice. And there's really two things to say here. The first thing is that, you know, we, 
welcome changes. We want people to contribute code. There are no arbitrary barriers to say, you can't do this. Now, maybe if it's completely mad, we won't ship it in the default. Uh, but, but actually, you know, we have support for a whole load of backends. So if you can build LibreOffice on Linux, it will run with RawX, GTK2, GTK3, KDE3, KDE4, and Trinity. I don't know if you're aware of the Trinity nope, KDE nope. <laughs> version. Well, you know, so uh, we could easily add several more to this list, and it, you know, will dynamically right. detect uh, what your desktop is, and try and pick the best thing uh, to use for that. So I think having a culture that says contributions are welcome, we want people to be involved, get stuck in, uh, you know, we'll try and help you make your dreams come true, uh, <laughs> is, is really important. You know. Okay. Um, so so that, uh, on that topic of people getting involved, if people do want to get involved with either. LibreOffice or, or as the or with the Document Foundation, where should they go? Bjorn did some great work here. Bjorn, do you want to talk about the Easy Hacks here? Well, yeah. Um, actually, we own the word key, uh, Easy Hacks. If you just Google that, you will find uh, a page that leads you to how to get started on LibreOffice. Excellent. So um, just type in the words Easy Hacks and it gives you an introduction Alan's of found it how now. to. <laughs> on how to build LibreOffice for the first time. Uh, and it actually has a list of things to do on LibreOffice to get started. And uh, each of those uh, has a mentor that should help you and uh, is selected by an experienced developer who thinks this should be easily doable by someone attacking this problem the first time and not having to know seven million lines of code. Excellent. So. Uh, um, and we have all this sorted out so that you can look like for C++ tasks, Python tasks, or whatever. Excellent. Uh, I also noticed that uh, when I recently downloaded uh, LibreOffice for my wife's evil Mac, uh, <laughs> there, there was the opportunity for me to donate, which I didn't at that point in time. But uh, do you find that successful, that having, having the, the download and then hey, you could give us a bit of money as well to help out. Is, has that been a successful thing? Because that, that seems relatively new. So actually, we've always asked for donations. Uh, we just didn't ask for them while you were downloading. And it turns out that, you know, while you're expecting this thing and you're, you've got a little time, right, because it's a couple hundred meg, yeah. you know, you can contemplate how much money you're <laughs> saving and, you know, how much good you could do for the world uh, by, by giving us a, a small donation. And, yeah, hey, you know, so we had something like 60,000 donors Oh. Uh, in the last year, oh, that gave awesome. us, you know, between five and ten euros or so each. And so that's quite a lot of money. And we're spending that to improve the project, make uh, free really? software better for everyone um, on all sorts of things, cool. uh, which really helps the Document Foundation stand on its own feet, build its own releases, you know, do, do its own stuff. Right. That's great. Okay. I think that's all we've got time for. So we're going to have to leave it there. But uh, Bjorn and Michael, thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And now it's time for command line. <laughs> if you could just make that noise for, you know, four minutes, then we'd uh, fill the whole segment, I think. Um, <laughs> can you do that? How's your no, circular breathing? Not. You sounded like a didgeridoo. Thanks. Uh, okay. So our command line love, uh, submitted by at CLI Magic. We're getting well, a lot of them. Submitted by, I think, probably stolen from. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, Very appro much. Appropriated from CLI Magic. On Twitter. On Twitter. Uh, and it's um, it looks like it's an image magic command line um, set of options, and the uh, the description says it gives your photo a vintage feel, a kind of command line Instagram. So you, what's an Instagram? An Instagram is uh, is is a um, it's a photograph. <laughs> yes, no, it's a, it's <laughs> it's commonly like a square photograph that often has various effects added to it and then right. posted online. Okay. Are you from the past or something? <laughs> so, um, Well, these photos look like they are. Get with <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you use convert. And then there's a couple of parameters, plus level colors and fire brick. And then you specify the photo you want to change and then whatever you want to call the new modified photo. So Tony is the photography expert. What on earth is fire brick? And why do I want to do this to my photos? So... 
Well, why you want to do it to your photos is a different question. But um, <laughs> the Ooh, get in. Uh, so yeah, Image Magic, which is the uh, package that provides the convert tool on yep. Ubuntu and Debian, um, is a fantastic tool for doing all sorts of things with images, and you can overlay images, resize them, reshape them, resample them, and adjust them. Yeah. Um, and this command line that we have here uh, provides a kind of a vintage feel to the photos. So you take a, a photo that maybe you took this week of your face um, and you want to look like it was maybe taken a little while ago well, so um, lose some weight first <laughs> <laughs> does it do that as well uh, no sadly oh, not okay. it's it's not a miracle package okay. um but uh <laughs> so yeah basically it's um <laughs> It makes the photo look old, like in a vintage style. Now, why you might want to do that is a different question. Uh, you have to ask all the users of something like Instagram. Right. Um, okay. Sometimes, I, in fact, I wrote a blog post a couple of years ago about what's what's so good about images that come from Instagram. I'm not saying they're not good, because I do like a lot of them. But why does making something look old or look different or look cross-processed or something make it look cool? Yeah. Um, but if you want to do that and want to be able to script uh, that, uh, for example, you can use the command line to do that. And this you... comes just by default from the image magic. Spelt with a CK on the end. Yeah, so image image magic, as you say, with a CK uh, is the package name in Ubuntu, and you can then get the convert tool, and you can run this against a particular uh, JPEG file or other files, presumably, right. and um, then it will do whatever it needs to do. Awesome. I it's funny. I, I've started. I had to use the convert uh, program recently. Um, I wrote a script to analyze uh, applications that are starting on Ubuntu phone to make sure that they're starting correctly. And one of the ways you detect whether an application has started correctly is if you actually get some content on the screen. If it's just completely white or completely black, then prob right. probably the application has crashed in some way. So what I do is I, I push an application onto the phone, start it, and then take a screenshot. And then Convert has the ability to um, take a percentage portion of the screen. And I only take the middle percentage, so I chop off the toolbar at the top and the bottom and calculate if that is all white or all black and if it is chances are the applications crash and i move that to one side ah. oh, it's, that's useful yeah, well. it's quite handy so we're probably going to put that in the data center to make sure that if whenever we do a phone update if it and and do, run that against all the apps in the store yeah. or a proportion of the apps in the store and then let mm. the developers know if we broke their app <laughs> cool which is well quite cool I, i've just run this uh, application uh, this command line against a picture and it sort of made it have a sort of red um, not it, quite sepia, but it's kind of a bit of a red, like a like a like a uh, faded photo, like a faded like a Polaroid you might have left out on the, uh, the windowsill What's for a, a, a decade. Hey, oh. <laughs> youngins, eh? Hey? Oh dear, oh dear. Anyway, so that's the end of the um, command line. Command love. I love that I now don't have the right thing up on because I was playing around with the images. Well, that's um, just typical. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> now some feedback oh man there's loads of it there is uh so Remy emailed us and he said howdy having uh, heard episode four and the command line love caught my attention um do you remember what it was this was the one about detecting what's filling up your boot partition oh yes, yes. oh yes that started some conversations yeah and <laughs> the on twitter was oh. going, it was on fire i don't think that Anyway, uh, one of my clients has, autom has an automated deployment framework which can spawn Ubuntu machines and automatically install them and put them into Chef, an orchestration framework. However, the PXE preseed.config file creates a 250 meg boot partition by default, which after a month or four gets filled up with Ubuntu kernels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that feeling. It bothered me so much that I first wrote a little command utility to automatically check the latest and running kernel and remove all the other ones. That's the thing I tried to do. I mean, yeah. did. <laughs> Successfully. Of course. Well. <laughs> it is more automated and the page has an, uh, a comprehensive explanation of each part of the commands used. Then I thought it would be a better idea to just edit the config file <laughs> to create a bigger boot cart partition. So we now have machines with a five gig slash boot since storage is almost free there. Uh, and he's written it up for CentOS, but didn't doubt that that's much use to us. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we have listeners who use Red Hat derived stuff. Um, that's really good. Yeah, that's really awesome. Thank you, Remy. Thank you very much. No problem. Mark. Uh, Greg Thompson emailed to say, why are you all moving to Dropbox from Ubuntu 1, an open service to a closed one? Hmm, was Ubuntu 1 an open service? Debatable. 
Um, have you looked at now. C-File? It is now, yes, you're right. C-File.com. It's open source and is quite advanced in its development. Uh, it has clients for just about everything and a cloud service if you don't want to run your own server. Uh, the server is easy to set up and even has builds for the Raspberry Pi. So this is another alternative to sync thing if you want an open source self-hosted thing. Oh. So who moved from Ubuntu 1 to Dropbox? Uh, I think when we were talking about Ubuntu 1, we were asking about well, Tony was lamenting the the demise of Ubuntu One. Yeah, I would have stayed with Ubuntu One if Ubuntu One was staying with me. And uh, oh, he's really thought about that as yeah. well. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I also use Dropbox, but I already used Dropbox before I used yeah, Ubuntu me too. One. I must admit, I quite like Dropbox. I've used it for a couple of weeks or so bit yeah. while I've been doing this. It's working out quite well. But yeah, it's always good to have an open alternative. Um, but I already had a Dropbox account, so you know who knows. Yes. Uh, Una Carlson emailed in to say, I found an explanation of Valley View as mentioned on season four, episode, uh, season seven, episode four, where a listener wanted a Valley View convertible tablet. I think we went blank at this point. Yeah, we, we didn't know whether that was what a brand or what. Car. Uh, Una says a Google search for Valley View tablet. Oh, we should have done that. <laughs> uh, bought up a Tom's Hardware article that indicated that Valley View will be an Intel Atom system on a chip based on the uh, Bay Trail architecture. Yeah. Oh, it all makes sense now. Yes. Uh, basically, Intel's attempt to compete with the NVIDIA Tegra 3 and Qualcomm S4 chips, which are insanely popular and quite beefy, uh, but ARM-based. So I guess this is, uh, if it's based on an Intel Atom, it'll be x86. Yes. Okay, so Valley View is the next step on from um, Bay Trail for small devices. Right. Thanks for the great show and greetings from South Africa. Greetings to you too. Cool. Yeah. Wow, South Africa, brilliant. Yeah. Um, Bill, who is better known to listeners of the show as Super Engineer in the RC channel, probably one of our most loyal listeners, yeah. I, I think. Yes. Certainly the uh, loudest voice in the RC channel. Um, <laughs> he's, he's emailed in to say, it seems obvious to me, but probably to absolutely nobody else, <laughs> that the show should be titled The One Where Super Engineer Goes Into Hospital the Day After, or maybe The One Where Super Engineer get, Got Too Close to the Kryptonite. Hmm, yes. Just kidding. Good luck, whatever the real show title is. Here's hoping for some pre-surgery fun. I, I don't think we should be quizzing him anymore on this. <laughs> this kind of, I, I did check with him that he was happy for us to uh, to read this out on the show. Okay. And I'm he, hoping he, he has some post-surgery fun too. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah that'll that be good. <laughs> or even fun during the surgery, as long as the surgeon's not having fun during the surgery and he's concentrating oh. on his job. Oh, or she. Have what you seen it's... Surgeon Simulator? Yeah, no. I've I've seen it. I didn't I didn't quite get it to work. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe if if it's like um, you know sometimes during brain surgery they keep you awake, so maybe he could listen to the podcast during the operation. Yes, someone should do that science. That sounds like interesting science. <laughs> yeah, it does. But good luck, basically, is what we're saying, Super Engineer. Yes, Come yes. back fit and strong and listening to the podcast, please. Don't have your taste removed. <laughs> uh, Joe Ressington uh, tweeted us. I'm still listening. Loved your unbiased 1404 review. Hope you like ours due Monday. So Joe Ressington is from the Linux Luddites podcast. Yes. Hi, Joe. Which is very listenable. Uh, Joe and another chap whose name has escaped me, and I'm sure Joe will tell me who that is. But uh, yeah, Linux Luddites, I strongly recommend people have a listen. It's it's worth a listen. Fantabulous. Uh, Paul White twitted, twittered, tweeted at us. Uh, so no more videos three times <laughs> to to uh, uh, so no more videos to accompany the weekly broadcast no no, no. it was just a pain and nobody watched it i, yeah. I had to uh, gaffer tape a, vi- a webcam to a curtain rod <laughs> every, every <week>. fortnight <laughs> every fortnight i forgot how to do it I had to figure it out and trail along usb lead across the front room it was a pain and, and it destroyed some of the magic of the show i think yeah. <laughs> we look better Broke on the, the radio mystery. yes yeah. yes yeah, people don't realise it's how slick we really are. I don't know. If you if you really got a lot from us being on video, let us know. But I doubt anyone really did. They, don't, they don't. can't have done because they didn't watch it. <laughs> and when well, Poppy didn't have. get around to posting them up afterwards, nobody complained. Uh, yeah, until now. Yes. Well. Uh, we also have some feedback from Luke, whose last name I can't pronounce. Ipasil? I'd go with that. I pursue, yeah. I pursue. Uh, just writing, as per request in the skit at the end of the last episode, to let you know a Canadian loves the show. Oh, that's oh, nice. Thank that's you. That's very nice. Thanks, I wonder Luke. if that's Luke or another Canadian he happens to be aware of. <laughs> <laughs> it's Emma Jen. Yeah. Oh, dear. And Laura, the last piece is down to you. Uh, Dithy on Twitter said, how did I miss four new episodes? 
lunchtime sorted for the next few days. Awesome. I don't know how you missed them. Subscribe to the RSS feed. Yeah. That's what it's there for. And they just appear. In fact, you get the bonus zero, episode zero as well then. Yeah. Which is well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Packed full of content. But not From season Tony. six, episode 30. Oh, uh, the long lost episode. Long lost. Oh. One day we yeah, might. We'll, we'll release it on our rarities compilation. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's hidden in the same crate as the uh, Ark of the Covenant is at the end of that uh, shot of uh, the Indiana Jones movie. I think. Yeah. 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 Just hope yeah. not everyone's faces falls off when they listen to it. Like <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant. Was that the gaming one? No. 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 We're not talking about gaming. No. Right. There we go. That's the end of your feedback. The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that enthralls, exasperates, or elevates you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. That's all for this show. So thank you very much indeed for listening. Um, we'll be back in a couple of weeks, which is Wednesday the 15th of May, at half past eight in the evening. That's in the UK. It's nearly my birthday. Half what, past half eight in the hold evening. On, hold on, no. You said Wednesday the 15th of May. Of May. Are you sure about that? At half past eight in the evening. No, I'm not sure about that now. I'm, I'm pretty, no, I'm 14th. 14th, yeah. 14th of May. Okay, was... the episode will be out on the 15th. So now not only can we not get times right, we can't get dates right either. Well, but I will be a whole year older. And it, I will oh. be almost a whole year older. But a lot wow. fewer years than Laura. Oh. Um, oh, that's a bit hard. <laughs> <laughs> to both well, of given you. Given how clueless you were about everything contemporary earlier on, I think, uh, yeah, I think it was appropriate. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, yeah, we're going to be back in a couple of weeks. We're which still is friends again. Wednesday, <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday the fourteenth, and or Thursday the fifteenth <laughs> at half past eight in the evening PM UK time, which is nineteen thirty UTC for those of you who live elsewhere. Um, Wait the rest it? of them yes. out yourself because you're pushing summer time. You said nineteen thirty. Yep. Yep. UTC. Oh, sorry. You're right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was thinking what time we get here. Right. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.